majority view in the USA. Okay, now the screen tells me this meeting's being live streamed. So welcome to those of you who aren't signed in, but you are actually watching. And that means we're recording it as well. Uh, what did they ask me to do? They asked me to deal with Australia, the evidence down under. Now, I run creation research. I better tell you a bit about myself. Uh, I will be making use of some Australiana, uh, like boomerangs, and I'm rather famous for that. Uh, all sorts of things like that. And yes, I do write books. So some we will mention in particular because they are still available in the USA. And uh, despite the fact that I haven't been seen in the USA physically due to COVID for the past couple of years, oh boy, have I missed traveling. But I tell you what, my garden looks better than it has been up until the recent floods, that is. Uh, all sorts of things have happened because of COVID. So if you want to look at our books and all of those sort of things, I'll switch on our website. Yep, we are under down under, but having things the right way up is much better. So if you have a look at our website, creationresearch.net, which will come up shortly, then uh, you'll actually see some of those books and the new DVDs that can be streamed, live streamed, et cetera, all those sort of things. So g'day, 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 which is my normal means of introduction. And uh, I do run creation research and I will be bringing a helper on a little later because he's actually come down to Australia as well. So I said to young Joe from the UK, listen, you found some very exciting fossils here in Australia and I'd like you to be part of this program because they need to see you. You got caught in the USA with COVID and it cost us a fortune to get you back out. Uh, you know, airline tickets went sky high, high etc. But so we're doing sort of three or four segments tonight. First of all is me. If you cope with me, then you're going to actually pass from the subject of creation through to sin, Joseph, the fall, uh, the fossil evidence of it, then back to me for Noah's flood, Jurassic Ark, and, and all the way down to the present world, e.g. good to bad to worse to Los Angeles is the history of tonight's program. That's how we're actually going to go. Then at the end of it, uh, we will take questions and tell you a bit more about creation research. So let me just switch on share screen here. Okay, so there we are. And share. I think we should be right there. Turn that one off there. Um, John has just disappeared by the looks of things. <laughs> Only John Mackay, hey? I love him to bits, but he, he doesn't do technology. Um, he probably, he's probably still talking. He probably doesn't even know that he's, he's been kicked off. <laughs> G'day, mate. You've 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 been chucked off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go get yeah, <laughs> yeah. No worries. He's gone to get his grandson, by the way, who is the uh, rescuer of all things technological, which is which is fine. Let me bring me back so I can. Well, let me, uh, while we're waiting for John to come uh, to come back in, let me give you a little bit of an introduction to me uh, and sort of my involvement in creation research. So, yes, as John has already said, we're going to try and sort of take you through Australia. Um, I couldn't help but sneak a little bit of English stuff in or British stuff in uh, because that is where I'm native to, although I've been over to Australia and spent quite a bit of time there uh, doing stuff with John and creation research. I've also been over to the States and done a lot of research over there as well. Uh, so we're going to be looking sort of through the whole history from creation to the fall to the recreation. And this is a big thing which we like to do in creation research is give people the full perspective, give people the big perspective uh, and also uh, show people the evidence of stuff as they go along.
Um, okay, one of the things that we do is, you know, we have a, a big research element uh, of our creation research, I and mean, we will call creation research. Research is a big part of the kind of stuff that we do. And if you were to buy the book called The Anti-Creationist Handbook, and yes, that is a real book that really does exist, one of the first things you'll see as you read through it is there's no way that the Bible can be true. There's no way that the earth could be just 6,000 years old. There's no way that we could ever trust the bible simply because well things like stalactites and stalagmites take hundreds of thousands if not millions of years to actually grow um now we were just talking about this in our weekly broadcast that goes out creation conversations um we have a museum project here in the uk and we have a whole load of specimens like this um this by the way is a stalactite. Are oh, the stalactites are the ones that hang from the caves, right? Um, a wonderful one. Now this was collected, it's from a very old collection, Victorian collection. It was co collected from Poland back when it was legal to go bashing things out of caves. They don't like doing you, uh, do, you doing that too much anymore. Um, but one thing in particular, which I want to draw your attention to is this edge here. You see, it was hanging down like this and you've got actually got sideways stalactites stalactites that are growing out sideways, not downwards. Now, what's the significance of this? Remember the point from the anti-creationist handbook? There's no way that the earth could be just a few thousand years old. There's no way that you could trust the Bible because things like stalactites and stalagmites, things like this take hundreds of thousands of years to grow. And yet I live in a, a wonderful place called Shropshire and just around the corner from where I live is Wales. And if you go just into Wales, you get to a village called Chirk. And if you go to Chirk, there's one of the first ever canal tunnels, you know, the little sort of barges, the little canal boats that go through these big tunnels that really go all riddle throughout uh, England. Well, we actually picked this up out of that canal tunnel. It was growing from the walls. It is a stalactite. Um, oh, it's interesting because it actually displays exactly the same type of formation that you see on our cave stalactite. You see how they're growing out sideways? It's growing down as well as sideways. And the reason why it's doing this is because the wind only blows in one direction through the canal tunnel. It was mm. a very clever engineer who actually designed all of this. Okay. What's the point? Well, you see all the, the, the soot and everything kind of mixed into it. I mean, this has been growing in just the last 150 years. The entire canal tunnel is only a couple of hundred years, about 250 years old. Uh, and I know that's a, a very, very long time if you're in America, but in Britain, where we have, you know, churches and houses that are well over a thousand years old, just a couple of hundred years really isn't very long at all. And it's certainly forming a lot, lot, lot quicker than it's supposed to. And you receive lots of criticism. You say there's no way that these things are anything like the ones in the caves. And yet we've measured the pH. We've taken tests. We've actually compared the two uh, all the way along. And everything that you can find from the chemical testing all the way up to just the basic observations of similarity tells you that this type of stalactite is exactly the same as this type of stalactite. And then you have to ask the question, well, if this one could grow quickly in just, you know, a few hundred years, how long did it take this one to form? And then you can start asking questions about, well, how do we actually make stalactites in the first place? And so you can do some experiments. You can end up making stalactite machines and you find out that actually, if you have the right process, if you have the right conditions, things like stalactites can grow really, really quickly. In fact, we have in Jurassic Ark, and John may well, uh, or I know that he will be showing you if he ever comes back, some wonderful back. videos. Oh, you are back, John. Excellent. Some wonderful pictures and videos of Jurassic Ark. And we do these kinds of experiments where we grow stalactites and stalagmites, and you can actually watch and observe. And we get the kids to come and they put little teddy bears and you can fossilize the teddy bears and the dripping stalactites. It's all about a process. Now, we're going to talk a lot about process tonight. We're going to talk about the process of creating. We're going to talk about the process that is affecting all of us, which is the degeneration process, the downhill process. It's a process that is, uh, you know, that sin uh, has affected us in. 
And we're also going to talk about another process, a process by which you can be born again. They're all processes, and it doesn't have anything to do with time. It doesn't have anything to do with evolution. doesn't have anything to do with millions of years. It all has to do with a process. So hopefully that sort of whetted your appetites just a little bit for some of the research and stuff we're going to talk about tonight. I had to kind of ad lib because it was all here. But John, I understand you're back. Let's see if we can get your... Uh, 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 slides uh, back up and we and will certainly again. do that Joe and great stand in there mate do appreciate that now let's try this for the second time okay screen two share screen and you'd think that I'd have this all absolutely up and running so let's just make sure my grandson confirms that it's great having the next generation so let's make them work for their living here we are Right, Nelly there. Okay, so there we are. All right, shrink that screen and hit the button. All right, so you'll see our website there, creationresearch.net. You've seen both logos now. And uh, as one of the things that uh, Joseph was saying was I run a place called Jurassic Ark. <coughs> it is uh, Australia's only outdoor creation museum. We have two museums in Australia. One is in Tasmania. That's the little island off the coast of mainland Australia. And we had Craig, the director there, on our other program this morning. Jurassic Ark, not named after millions of years, but after the Jura Mountains, because the fossils here are the same as the ones in the Jura Mountains. What's the aim of Jurassic Ark? We make no apologies, right? Absolutely none, whether I'm in a university giving a lecture whether I'm on doing a debate against a, a, an atheist, right? There is my aim. All things are made by Christ and for Christ. And the reason God expects us to believe that is A, it happens to be true. B, he's so confident, he says, test everything and only keep the things that turn out to be true. And the New Testament says, if it's not true that Christ rose from the dead, then your faith is a waste of time. Put those three things together and come and visit Australia. By the way, you're nearly allowed in now. All of you Americans over there, all of you Brits, uh, you can really sort of look forward to coming back to Australia and we look forward to seeing you. There's Australia tucked down in the bottom right-hand corner of the map there. Here it is close up. And you'll see the arrow to Jurassic Arc. And we take school groups there. We take primary school groups. We take high school groups. We take the general public. It started when we found some rocks that were looking like trees. Um, families dig the place, there's no doubt about it. They come and they enjoy it. Now, I don't know about you, but going to school and having to sit through maths and all those sort of things, going to university lectures and copy down notes, I find it much more stress relieving to hit a rock particularly when politics is involved and you've got to think elections like we have here in Australia. So we have teams. Uh, we include people like Dr. Diane Eager. She was for many years a medical lecturer in biology. So uh, if we've got any issues about science and biology or medicine, we first of all ask her. But even she loves digging rocks. Actually, do you realise Jesus knew about rocks? Because we call these petrified trees. They look like trees, but they're turned to stone. And Jesus would have understood that word because he said that he played a word game with Peter. He said, I call you the rock. But then that's what we call these too, Peterified. Peter as in stone. Peter as in rock. So Diane comes up to Jurassic Ark. Uh, we have big groups there. There's our little model of Noah's Ark. We even have things to teach kids about the dinosaurs. Oh, you can see the dinosaur there. <coughs> I'll guarantee you don't know what the other one is. It's that petrified tree you saw that family digging up. We've lifted it back up again, and it is the world's first petrified tree sundial. Come on. Where else have you heard of a petrified tree turned into a sundial? But I'll tell you what. See my watch here? Oops, I better turn it around so you can see it. That sundial is more accurate than any watch on the planet. Why do I say that? Because the Bible says God not only made the sun, not only says that he made the trees, but he made the sun and the moon and the stars for signs and for times and for seasons. So sundials 
surprise, surprise, even though you had to change time every village you went to because it was in a different position, but they were absolutely accurate. That's a petrified tree sundial. Of course, it was rather funny when we put it up and the kids are all looking at it. We're explaining to them what it does. And one kid puts his hand up and says, how does it work at night? Well, at night time, you'd have to use the stars. I mean, there's a 24-hour clock up in the sky. We call ours the Southern Cross. In fact, from Los Angeles, you can probably just see the Southern Cross. And your, well, your home church there is just outside of Los Angeles. All right. <clears throat> we have dinosaurs. You can see creationresearch.net. And that's just not any dinosaur. Those two dinosaurs are Queensland dinosaurs. Jurassic Ark, Queensland, Australia. Um, these are from a place called Winton, just outside of Winton. Uh, they're models, of course, but everybody knows none of them happen by accident. Okay, stop and think a moment. You're a skeptic, you're a doubter, you're struggling trying to understand Genesis through John, through the book of Revelation. Well, I don't guarantee to be able to tell you everything about the book of Revelation today, but we can go a fair way on Genesis because it's actually happened and you can test everything that's been said. Okay, so dinosaurs, the word itself was invented by a creationist, or didn't they tell you that? It's amazing what's deliberately been left out of education. Dinosaurs out at Winton, Australia. Now, we said their evidence that they've been made. Everyone knows that. They're, they're fiberglass casts. They can cost you up to a couple of thousand dollars each. The name of them? Well, you make up the name if you're the first finder. Uh, that's how it works. There's no secret to this. Of course, the kids come and they love, we even get little baby ones. Now, his name's not a patasaur. That's just a, a pun on a bigger name dinosaur. That guy there is one of those ceratopsis. Uh, look at this one here. He's pretty popular with the kids. Actually, see how popular kids get with dinosaurs? Can I warn you, you parents who are educators, perhaps your home education, can I encourage you in home education for one reason? Our world today is determined to not tell you the truth through secular education. You don't learn that dinosaur is a word invented by a creationist. You don't learn the man who invented the word founded the biggest naturalist museum on the planet, and he was sure that dinosaurs were the monsters God made. Now, don't be surprised that was his conclusion because he's actually got a Bible verse in the roof of the British Natural History Museum. Ah, the world had a God-centered, a Christ-centered focus. You go to that same museum today, you'll see Charles Darwin sitting on the steps, not Sir Richard Owen. This kid loves dinosaurs, but then don't be surprised. You see, many years ago, the Skeptics Association decided that they would use dinosaurs to convince the kids to not believe the Bible. Now, if you're wondering why we produce books on dinosaurs, and again, go to our website, creationresearch.net, look up all the kids' books on dinosaurs. Why kids' books? Because they are brainwashed. They are aimed to be gotten at by dinosaurs. Um, how old is a dinosaur? Most kids will say, millions of years. Who made the dinosaur? And the Christian kids will say, God. When did he make them? Millions of years ago. The story is so confused because they're not using God's word as the source. The skeptics decided ages ago that dinosaurs were the best way to teach unbelief to kids. Oh, so look, even the big kids, you come to Jurassic Ark and we have virtual reality dinosaurs. This is the first day we display these. See the high school girls? Ah! Dinosaurs appear. Now, we can't create them that fast, except as a virtual image, and it's fantastic. And you can come to Jurassic Ark, and you can see pterodactyls flying through the sky. Amazing. By the way, they appear instantly. Yep, look at that. Now, uh, it'd be nice if we could make the real ones like that, but the Bible says in six days God made the heavens and the earth, and we tend to think that's how long he took. Now, he didn't even need six days any more than we needed six days to actually make this thing appear. A click of the button. Time? Well, Joseph already mentioned the little comment. It's not time, but process. Well, that's Jurassic Ark. I run Jurassic Ark. 
I write books, I lecture on creation. Some of you I've met before. I'm looking forward to the next time we're allowed into the USA. We have a curator, Daryl. Now, Daryl used to be a missionary. He looks a bit of a bushy, doesn't he? He spends all of his time up at Jurassic Ark, digging fossils, cleaning up weeds and, and, and checking the gardens, running tours and having to put up with a boss like me. Some days that can be a little hard. Oh, he didn't work a full day yesterday because we had about six or seven inches of rain. And he said, I gave up when the water started coming up the drains and all the shrimps were swimming up the gutters. So he said, I just went home. It's been very wet out here. By the way, the Bible says there was a time when it was very wet. And most people think I couldn't believe in Noah's flood. In fact, the first day I did geology, the first week rather at Queensland University on a way to get my degree, the professor said, we're not going to discuss any such rubbish as catastrophic geology, Noah's flood, etc." Shame. Modern education is designed to brainwash people out of believing the Bible is true. So you're going to have a chance to ask us questions today. And perhaps many of those questions you'll be surprised have come from what you've been brainwashed about. Not from the facts, not from the evidence, but that's fine. You need to actually ask them. So Daryl's at Jurassic Ark all the time, and he gets to play with toys like this. Not me. I'm the curator. I'm there posing of the photograph, and Daryl is taking it. How would you like one of those sharks? Yes, shark is what it is, and you find the fossil evidence on, on just off the shore of Florida. You find it in Western Australia. You even find some of these in New Zealand, and it sure makes a great pose for families coming to Jurassic Ark. So can I encourage you? Go to creationresearch.net and click Museum. Have a look at all of these. Sharks, evidence. The Bible says everything was made by God. It didn't happen by itself. You realize that's the literal translation? Everything didn't happen by itself. Everything was made by Christ and for Christ, not just by God, if all we had was Genesis chapter one, we wouldn't know which God created. I'm serious. The word God in Genesis is a position like king, emperor, the one at the top. The word Christ is a name. The word Lord is a name. Ah, shark. That's a big shark. How big was that megalodon? Well, do you see the, the scuba diver in the illustration? That gives you a partial idea. But we did this for fun. We got some of our uh, guys who work with virtual reality and we said, make us a megalodon that will come to the park and people can go, ah, that's how big it was. There it is floating above my vehicle. Now that's a shark. Wow. Oh, and by the way, straight out of Scientific American, um, they had an article on shark evolution. Oh, I've changed the name a little. Can you see what I've called it? Shark devolution. In six days, God created, and everything he made was very good. I can't overemphasize that enough. When God had finished, there was nothing wrong with the planet. If you're complaining about the taxes or about the problem of evil or about the war in Ukraine, don't blame God. When he gave it into our hands, it was in perfect shape. Ah, uh, Do you notice one thing? Big sharks gave rise to little sharks, gave rise to... Well, you still think the great white shark is a monster. Um, well, it is compared to us, but compared to what it used to be when it was a vegetarian, did you catch what I said? The Bible is emphatic that in the beginning, nothing was killed. All creatures were good. Everything ate plants. Now, I'm a fisherman. The one thing I can tell you is the first shark I caught, I had forgotten one rule. The fisherman, the older fisherman said, you want to go shark fishing? Take a gun. Why? Because when you haul them on board, they're still alive and they thrash around all over the place. And if they're bigger than you, that's a bit of a threat. <clears throat> but when all things were made, they were not just made by God. They were not just made by the one who was at the top. They were made by the God who was called Jesus Christ. You need to understand that. So if you've got questions about creation today, Sooner or later, they'll get back to a question about the creator, which sooner or later will get back to who did all this? So what? Ah, okay, the rest of the story, and I'll tell you what, there it is there. Now, when I actually go and give a lecture at the university, when I actually do a debate, I can't get away from this picture. 
because Richard Dawkins, David Attenborough are all talking about a world that's full of errors and they're trying to explain how it got to be like it did. And the Bible says, no, it started out without any errors and look how far it has fallen. Now, those two are totally different perspectives. You want to know something? Many of your questions will come from your brainwashing that this is how things have happened. I mean, let's just illustrate it. We're going to be talking about Noah in a little while. How primitive a man was Noah? I mean, he built an ocean liner and better than Ken Ham's boat, it actually floated, right? He didn't do any trials. He didn't have any sails. He had no backup boats on there to have life rafts. Um, he only got one chance at it and he got it right because he was made in God's image. And even though sin had come in, he was so superior to us technologically wise, you'll find that you need to understand the reason you have trouble building an ark or you need to spend hundreds of millions of dollars is that our brains are fallen, good to bad to worse, to Los Angeles, to California, to the USA, to Australia, etc. You see the two popular words there, degeneration and devolution. Oh, sorry, did I say popular? Uh, you know, when I debate people, they get really mad when I use the word devolution. I mean, Richard Dawkins has a big argument on how God can't be real because his eyes are failing and he needs glasses. Well, God is real because he had eyes in the first place. His eyes have gone downhill because of a problem called sin, and he's used his creativity to invent glasses. Come on, which monkey do you know of invented glasses for wearing on gorilla outings? And no, no, they don't do things like that because we alone are creative. Did you catch that? We're made in God's image, so one of our properties is we create. Glasses don't happen by themselves. They don't take time. They take a process. The smarter you are, the faster they get done. Have you got that yet? Uh, it's true. You see, when you invent a newer technique, have you ever figured out how come we can make those glasses for $20 each now when they used to cost $200 a pair? We're getting better at it. We're getting better materials, and it didn't happen by itself. Okay, now Jurassic Arc exists to remind people there are plenty of opinions and theories that disagree with the Bible, but the facts never do. So warning, when you're talking to people and say, but I couldn't believe that in the Bible, don't go on the defensive. Don't try and argue from ignorance. Just grab a Bible and hand it to them and say, show me which part you can't believe. Do you know what you're going to find? <laughs> they haven't even read it. They don't know which part they don't believe. So open up the Bible and say, let me help you. Do you have a trouble with this? And 40 days and 40 nights it rained. Or there was a rainbow after a flood. Uh, most of the things you'll find, like uh, it's just a drop in the bucket. They already believe that because it's actually a statement from the Bible. There are plenty of opinions and theories that disagree with the Bible, but the facts never do. What you're willing to find, uh, what you'll find is if you are willing, is that God's word happens to be true from the beginning, but you'll need to say, if it is true that nothing happened by itself, what would the evidence be? If it was true that time can't make a man but process can, what would the evidence be? If it is true there was a worldwide flood, what would the evidence be? And while you're doing that, can I encourage you to ponder getting the money together and buying yourself a website and coming and visiting Jurassic Ark online? Or better still, we would love to see you in Australia real live where you can come and learn that all things were made by Jesus and for Jesus. That is the other half of the verse. I don't apologize. When we're talking about this subject, the person we're talking about is the one who brought it into being. Uh, the importance of it, see this young man? He came to work one day at Jurassic Park. Do you look at that fossil tooth he's got? Man, do you realize we had fossil marsupial lions in Australia? Um, yeah, lion, marsupial lions, you know, cuddly koalas. Uh, marsupial lions also were here. And uh, he stayed that night, and the next morning we led him to Jesus Christ. Now, that's what Jurassic Ark is about. So, yes, you do expect in this program to learn about the evidence for creation, stuff that you can take away, stuff that you can nicely demolish your friend's opinions if they are wrong, but you have an aim. Your agenda is to get them past their objection to the person pass the objection to the person. And by the way, here's a person you need to know about. There's my darling wife.
you realize how many years of people going fossil digging with her husband she's had to put up with? How many dinosaurs she has on her on her front porch, right? This is unbelievable. She's the only woman I know with at least 50,000 fossils around the house. Um, she needs an award. <laughs> she needs you to pray for her. She's been a dear and godly wife. She hasn't been all that well this year. But you see, one of the things we have to remember all the time is when the Bible talks about creation, it talks about the whole creation. And then God said, let there be lights in the firm of the heavens to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and seasons and days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament to give light on the earth. And it was so. Question, are the stars for signs and times and seasons? I mean, we said we'd give you ways to deal with your friends. Uh, question, um, have you seen some star signs like the Southern Cross? Do you know what it's for? Well, I love to share with people you can tell the time by. It's a 24-hour clock. I love this statement here. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, just something extra to do on a, on a Wednesday, Thursday afternoon. I mean, what are you going to do? Um, but you see, think carefully. What we're going to do for my last little segment before Joseph takes over is play time team. I'm going to get you to join the dots because either this is true or it's not true. He made the sun. He made the moon. He made the stars, uh, and he, he he did this all. Oh, by the way, we invented words like sun and moon because the moon actually reminds us of the month. Um, he invented the time. We sort of use these words to describe it, and he made the stars also. But if this is true, where does the evidence show? Because the Bible says God made the world in just six days, and Joseph's already told you he didn't need the time. It was a process. So why did he bother taking as long as six days? Let's help you. Now, there's a question you probably haven't asked, right? I mean, up at Jurassic Park, we've got cows in the paddock. And we know one thing, no dung beetles, too much plop. I mean, it builds up and up and up. If you made a world full of dinosaurs with plops that are half a ton each, can you imagine what the world would look like after a week? <coughs> dung beetles uh, are a very vital part of our biological economy. But look at the size of them. Yep, these are my pictures. I took the dung beetle leaving and going back home. So when you have a look, there's the dung beetle. Um, the dung beetle, he comes from home. Our dark dung beetle comes out at night. Um, what's he going to do? Well, number one, he goes out. He, he can find the dung with no trouble because, well, so can you. Just shut your eyes and go, <laughs> you can find the dung with no trouble whatsoever. Well, he goes, he gets it, and he rolls it up. I was fascinated to find two dung beetles helping one another roll a big ball of dung home. And in case you don't know what the dung is used for, he's going to take it, he's going to give it to his girlfriend and say, here, marry me. It's true. That's what they do with it. Um, obviously, it's not the way you would invite your girlfriend to home. It's not the way you would get married. But I tell you what, for dung beetles, it's successful. They sure do multiply and fill the earth. Um, but have you ever pondered what you actually need for this to work? What do you need to make a dung beetle? You see, the average evolutionist thinks, given hydrogen, everything can happen. But hydrogen without a space to be in doesn't even start. So where did the space come from? Sooner or later, you end up with the chicken and the egg problem big time. What do you need to make a dung beetle? I'll give you a bit of a help. You need dung. Dung beetle, no dung, you're stuck. But to get dung, you need plants because the cows have got to eat the plants or the dinosaurs. But to have plants, you've got to have soil. To have soil, you need water. If you don't believe me, try growing pot plants. You need all of that or nothing happens. And, of course, to make this whole system work, you not only need Mr. Dung Beetle who goes and get collects dung, you need Mrs. Dung, dung Beetle. Okay, so here's our Dung Beetle burrow again. And here's his problem, which way is home? No, that's not my picture. That's a commercial one. But it's a pretty cute old picture. Why is the Milky Way doing in the sky there? Well, back to me again. Whoops, where do we go? There's our dung beetle. He's on his way out. Now, we know how he finds his way home because we've tricked him. How do we trick him? 
Um, think carefully. He's a tiny beetle. We've got fossil dung beetles. There's no evidence they've ever been any bigger in the past. They've always been the same size. Some creatures have been huge, not dung beetles. Okay. One, one thing we've done is we've followed what he does. When he leaves, just as the sun is setting, you, you see the picture of the sky there? Okay. We've discovered that he can tell where west is by the look of the sky. But then so can you. I mean, that's the side where the light is still a little bit and the other side's darker. You got that clue, even though you're not an astronomer, correct? Okay. He uses the position of the sun and the moon. Yeah, this is a dung beetle that big. Uh, what else does he do? Well, the interesting thing, of course, is he uses the direction of polarized light. Polarized light, sunglasses. You know, we use polarized glass in sunglasses. You want to know what that means? That means if you pull one lens out and you twist it, everything will go black because the light sort of cancels itself out. Now, the interesting thing is when the light comes from an object, travels through space and it hits a surface, from then on, the light adopts the polarity that's given to it by the direction of that surface. So if it hits two surfaces and they're at right angles, then those lights are going at different polarities. You say, how do you know this? You keep watching. It's interesting. There's the Milky Way. Uh, the Milky Way, have you noticed it moves at night? It does. It travels across the whole sky. So do all the stars. And they travel the same position every night. I mean, if you ever wondered how Christopher Columbus found his way home before they invented GPS, you did know he didn't use GPS, I hope. Okay, he just followed the stars. Go one step further. The Milky Way creates a spectral gradient right across the sky. And so you say, how do we know all this is true? Well, there's our dung beetle. He's looking at the Milky Way. We know he uses the Milky Way. And you say, how do you know all this? Let's be really tricky. Your dung beetle comes out. He's smaller than the grass. He can spot the light. He doesn't need to see the sun or the moon. He can just sense the light. Same as you can coming through the grass. He got a map in his head that puts the light there. The Milky Way shifts, but he sees a band of light in one position when he starts and it's moved when he turns around and come back. The polarity of the light from the stars will shift. Um, how do we know this? Simple. You put a camera on the ground and you film it, and then you actually project the first image on a transparent sky. So that what you do is then shift the whole, you know, you go to those astrodomes where they can put this, the sky up on the dome and you can watch it, and then you can twist it. Or you can do the same for a dung beetle. And you know what happens? If you twist the sky, he never again finds his way home. Poor Mrs. Dung Beetle. Okay, stop a moment. What do you need to make a dung beetle? Well, it's not just simple enough for you to make the following. Dung, soil, plants, water. You need all of those things. But you see, that's not what enables the dung beetle to actually find Mrs. Dung Beetle, the vital part of the equation. That's not the, what, what enables him to find his way home. He needs a planet. The planet is for the plants to grow on. He needs an inbuilt GPS so he knows what the light means. He needs the light, he needs the sun, he needs the stars. Yep, and all of those need a universe. Now I'll guarantee they never taught you that in biology 101 subsection dung beetle, did they? Because what they want you to do is think dung beetles got here by accident and they figured out if the bad smell is over there, I walk there and then I walk back home. The dung beetle can't even see its way home. It can't even see through the grass. The dung beetle needs to have all of these things in place. And in reality, the God who made it, Jesus Christ, did all this in just six days. You see, if he's going to make dung beetles on, what day did he make the beetles? Day five or day six, take your pick. If you're going to have a poop on day six and day seven, then the dung beetle needs to have all of this in place by the time he's here. He can't wait another three years for God to get the sun and the moon in place. He can't wait another 20 years for the universe to be finished. This is not an issue of time. This is an issue of absolutely rapid process. Well, my time's just about done here. I'm going to remind you, 
go to creationresearch.net, click Q&A. There's lots more Q&As coming up. Joseph's going to come on shortly. But you'll also find on our website some books, Tights, Mites and Fossil Fights. I'd encourage you, if you want evidence for six days, that's a good place to go. Now, Joe, you've been to Australia. I'm going to turn off my share screen here. Okay, I'm back on. Can you find, can you get there yet, Joe? Yeah, I'm here. That's fine. Okay, can you bring your screen up without me doing anything further? Yeah, no, just leave yourself. I'm fine. I'm all good. Yep, we'll go from there. All right. So John has asked me to come aboard and uh, take the next session where, I mean, John's been talking about things like evidence of design, right? He's been talking about, I mean, we have a whole program. If you thought his uh, bit on dung beetles about dung beetles and their dung was interesting, you should see the whole program where we talk about dinosaurs and their dung because um, it goes on and on and on. And it's great fun. And it really does show the, the genius as well as the, uh, I suppose, humor that God has in creating things. It is incredibly clever. All right. I'm taking the next section. We're going to look at some of the consequences of sin. We're going to have a look at the big picture from good to bad to worse to where we are today. And yes, we'll be starting in Australia uh, with some of our evidence, with some of our finds. But I'm sorry, I'm not from Australia, even though I love Australia and I can't wait to get back to Australia. I'm from England. And uh, as a result, I've snuck a few little special English surprises in there as well for you. All right, let's share my screen and get it up and uh, working. Hopefully it goes through nice and smoothly. There we go. You should be able to see a screen. You should be able to see a cartoon of John and myself, uh, the creation guy, John Mackay and the fossil man, Indiana Joe Hubbard. That was a name that was given to me. Oh, getting on for five years ago now uh, when I was in Australia. Then you can see that we have a weekly broadcast every Friday night or that's Friday afternoon for you over in the States. It's at 9 p.m. UK time, so that's sort of 3 p.m. Uh, USA Central time. So what would that be? That would be sort of 2 p.m. for you or somewhere around there. Um, but it goes out, but they stay up on YouTube, so you can come and watch it. This broadcast is going out on YouTube as well, so you can catch up on this afterwards if you uh, you know need to leave or want to watch it again or uh, so on and so forth. But come and uh, join me and John every Friday. Um, it'd be great to, to see you there. It'd be great for you to subscribe. It'd be great for you to interact with our chat. We have live questions and answers and all sorts of stuff. So you can really get to grips with some of the research we do, as well as ministry updates and everything else beside. And we have some great guests as well that come on this broadcast uh, program. Uh, we had another Australian, Craig, on there this evening talking about some wonderful forestry things. And we get scientists, including actually, uh, I want to get a, a scientist from your neck of the woods in the States who's come aboard and he's working with creation research. His name's Dr. Glenn Wilson, and he's doing a really, really great job. And we spoke to him not too long back and did uh, some interviews with him for a radio pro program. Um, so it's great to have have him lord willing we'll get him come aboard so you can see him as we go as well let's see if i can actually change something here there we go uh by the way creation conversations is not just on uh, youtube we're also on every major podcast service as well whether it's spotify or google or apple or whatever you choose you can actually listen to us it goes out every week so you can listen to us as you drive and do all sorts of stuff all right, a little bit about me and what I do before we delve into the Australian side of things. Um, I've been working with John basically since 2014. I was a young university student. I just started my degree in geology. I knew I was called into some kind of ministry, didn't know what. Doors kept closing wherever I tried. And then finally the door opened to John Mackay and I walked through it and I've never looked back. And uh, both me and John firmly believe that uh, God brought us together in ministry. And so he sort of took me under his wing. He took me around the UK. He's taken me to Australia. And a couple of years ago, he took me to the USA for the first time. Well, now I'm starting to sort of fly the nest, so to speak, and do some of my own sort of uh, ministry. And we're now running the ministry here in the UK. Uh, we've had a bit of a tough time because of COVID, but Lord willing, we'll be over in the States sometime. So it'd be great to come and see you guys it'll be great to do some ministry over in the usa but this is a big project that we've got going on here in the uk at the moment it's the creation research museums project 
Now, you've seen that uh, Jurassic Arc. Uh, Craig, who was uh, on Creation Conversations tonight, has Creation Research Tasmania uh, Museum. We are, are working on a Creation Research USA Museum as well. So get behind us and support us with that if you can, because that's exciting. But this is what's going on here in the UK. Uh, creationresearch.net, Creation Research Center is our UK website. So go and check that out. We have over 20,000 fossils and artifacts. Collections include things like natural history displays, geology, fossils, archaeology, all sorts of wonderful stuff that the Lord has blessed us with. And if you want a little bit of a, a sneak peek as to some of the more exciting artifacts that we've had recently, um, here's a wonderful donation that came through a few months back of a large Egyptian mummy. And you think, what on earth has an Egyptian mummy actually got to do with the Bible or understanding the Bible? Well, it's got quite a lot, actually, because it's artifacts like this that do one of two things. You see, they are, in one sense, very, very dateable because you don't have to rely on things like carbon-14 to date them. Because from the style and the texture and everything else, you can tell which period they fit into. And then, of course, you start arguing about periods and archaeologists just go on for hours and hours and hours. So what you can actually do is get artifacts like these and use them as pinpointers to understanding a biblical chronology. And we have a great guy, Dr. John Osgood, who's done a fantastic job at looking at Egyptian chronology. I highly recommend his books. And so it's things like these that can help get a bigger perspective on things. Then it's wonderful things like this. Um, you see the big brick that I'm holding there? This is an old Babylonian brick. You see the writing, the old cuneiform? This is a brick which talks about King Nebuchadnezzar, straight out of the Bible. In fact, we can go one step further than this. There's the translation, right? Um, I mean, there it is with the cuneiform squiggles. There it is with the transliteration. What does it actually say? Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who provides for Eskila and Isida, eldest son of Napabalaza, king of Babylon, am I? And that I bit at the end is very significant because it means that King Nebuchadnezzar himself actually stamped that brick. Yes, if you come to our Creation Research Museums project in the UK, you can actually come and see and touch a brick that Nebuchadnezzar touched. And by the way, this is all very, very legitimate stuff. You can even see where it used to actually be held in the British Museum, one of the oldest and most prestigious and largest um, artifact and archaeological museums in the world. Yes, the Lord has abundantly blessed us with being able to get hold of some of these wonderful artifacts, things from the time of Hezekiah, wonderful fossils of fish and crocodiles and giant crinoids. And hey, look at that fish at the top there. Big fish, little fish. Um, yeah, big fish has previously eaten little fish and he's been buried with such an enormous amount of pressure. It's forced little fish out of its mouth. Now, there is rapid burial for you. Yeah, the evidence is clear and abundant with all the field trips, with all the work that we do, with all the travels. And we come and we get them and we put them all display. And just like at Jurassic Ark, people who come to our museums, people who come on our field trips, people who engage with our ministry, they all learn that all things were made by Jesus Christ. Ah, that's the key important point. So get behind the Creation Research Centre because it affects the USA, it affects Australia, we're all together in one ministry even though we're in different countries, we all support each other, I travel to the States, John travels to the States, we come and do ministry, we take our fossils around with us, so visit creationresearchcentre.com, support the UK Museum Ministry, sign up to our UK newsletter because you'll also find out when we're doing stuff in the States as well. And this is where we lead on to. This is a message which we also promote in our museums, and it's a real key thing that we need to understand this evening. Let this mind be in you that is also in Christ, Paul says to the church at Philippi. Philippians 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you that is also in Christ. See, John has been talking about a world that is very, very good. And yet we live in a world that is not very good anymore. And yes, in our Western minds, we don't like to 
think of it like that. Yes, in our proud Western minds, we like to think that we're getting bigger and bigger and better. We like to think that we've got better in the last, you know, few hundred years and we've established massive civilizations and towns and cities and technology and wow, wonderful we are. And yet the Bible says, no, in the beginning, everything was very good. And then something went wrong. And we've been going downhill ever since. And we're going to look at some rather interesting evidence of this. Let's take you to Newcastle. Not the original Newcastle uh, in, uh, in England. This is Newcastle, Australia. And I have to say, having been to both Newcastles, I favour the Australian one over the English one. There you can see me and John. We're sharing a picnic lunch down on the beach. We love this kind of stuff. After our hard day's work digging for fossils, you can't beat a good picnic lunch. Um, this was in 2018 when I was taken to Australia. We were doing research. We were doing ministry. This was just before I started full time in creation research ministry. And what was John doing there? Well, he was showing me a rather wonderful fossil deposit that John had found many, many years before. You see the things I'm pointing at? They are giant fossil trees lying flat in the rock. And the sea has come up and eroded the rock away. So just the ionized, fossilized, petrified trees are exposed. Now, even though they're preserved in iron, these trees are so well preserved that we can actually tell exactly what type of tree they were before they became a fossil. This is a fossil pine tree, and I'm pointing them out to you. And hey, can you see all the pine trees there? They're all pointing in the same direction. You see, year one of my geology degree, I uh, learned first thing, if you find things like trees or squid fossils or long elongated fossils that are all buried pointing in the same direction, they've been buried in a flood because the water has come along, it's swept it along and it's swept them up and it's made them all point the same way. These have been buried under flow, no doubt about it. And then John took me to a very interesting tree. You see the one that I'm climbing up to? This is actually a tree which is protruding up through many, many layers. Oh, you see all of the layers? You see the tree sticking up through all the layers? This is a polystrate tree. Uh, the term polystrate was coined by Derek Ager, who was the professor uh, at uh, Swansea University in Wales here in the United Kingdom. And poly means many. Straight refers to strata or layers. This is a tree which goes up through many, many layers. Um, there it is right there. There's another one um, further down along the beach. In fact, we were finding hundreds of these trees all over the place. Now, if you believe in evolution, you believe that these trees are 255 million years old. These are the Permian deposits. And now the word Permian has nothing to do with the 255 million years because well, we've been indoctrinated, we've been brainwashed. So when we see words like Jurassic and Triassic and Cretaceous and Permian, we automatically think millions and millions of years. But now Permian was named after a place. The place was Perm in Russia, right? Jurassic, named after the rocks in the Jura Mountains in Germany, the place where they were first studied. Devonian, named after Devon, right here in England, where you go and have your cream teas. Yeah, all these things are named after place names or what the rock is made up of. Um, nothing to do with millions of years in the slightest. And in this Permian rock, you have a vertical fossil pine tree. And one thing you know for certain, that pine tree was buried by the surrounding rock and the surrounding sediment before it had chance to rot away. Ah, this is not a representation of slow, gradual accumulation of sediments over millions of years. This is evidence of a rather large flood. All right, you see the line that I'm standing on? That's a boundary for, well, there's a big coal seam under there. Now, the coal, the hard, shiny black stuff, well, we love it when we find these kind of coal seams, especially the thin ones, because we can crack them open and open them up and find all sorts of wonderful fossils. I mean, great, wonderful fossil leaves from down there at the base of the tree, but not a single pine needle or soil. You know what that tells you? That tree 
did not live there. Oh, the old evolutionary story, the tree lived there, the tree died there, and slowly it sunk down into the swamp and slowly it got accumulated. But I'm afraid there's no pine needles, there's no soil, there's no way that that tree lived there, died there and got buried there. That tree was picked up, it had its roots stripped, it had its bark and its branches stripped, and it was swept along and it was buried in a vertical position very, very quickly indeed. Now, we spent our whole wonderful time digging up fossils and excavating stuff, and you can see some of the absolutely beautiful and wonderful fossils that we were digging up, wonderful fossil plants with their funny little arms and fingers branching out. And then I started digging on this bit. Oh, yeah, it was very wet. The tide was coming in. We were hurrying to try and get as many fossils as we can. We were splitting rocks open. And I mean, can you tell what's going on in there? I mean, you need to have a bit of a trained eye to know the kind of fossils that you're looking for. But I was working through this and I recognised this as a fossil seed fern. Yes, today ferns don't have seeds, they have spores. But in the past there was another kind of fern and they did have big seeds. They almost had, well, they were sort of like sort of strange uh, cones almost um, that held all the seeds together. And as I was digging through, oh, you see the big cone over there on the uh, on the right hand, uh, the left hand side, and then have a look at where the arrow's pointing. You see, I started to notice something in this bit of plant. Oh, you see the the sort of spiky thing sticking out the side of the plant. Ah, oh, I wondered what this was. Get in a bit closer. You can start to see the definition. It's looking very very spiky. Take it out. Clean it up make sure you can see it properly and there's absolutely no doubt about it we are looking at a set of fossil thorns oh yes you can get hung up over the botanical terms because i mean a rose has thorns correct uh no actually a rose has prickles it doesn't have thorns um and they are actually botanically different but the point is still the same no pun intended if it's sharp and it's spiky according to the bible they are thorns and thistles. What's the significance? Oh, we'll get to that. Yeah, no doubt about it. There's these fossil thorns, the first ones ever found in Australia. And it was found by myself. And I like to make sure that John Well knows that I found them um, because I like to say that I found the first ever fossil thorns, but I really didn't. That has to go to John Mackay. You see, the biblical point is that this rock formed after Adam sinned according to the Bible. Now, here's the world's first uh, fossil thorn find from John Mackay. And yes, his ones were significantly nicer than my ones. And there's no doubt about that. I mean, look at those fantastic thorns all the way from Nova Scotia in Canada. And by the way, John, you've promised me a trip to Nova Scotia at some point, so I will hold you to your word that you get to, I mean, I know COVID has kind of messed up most of that, but I'd love to go back to Nova Scotia, or I'd love, I'm sure John would love to go back to Nova Scotia. I'd like to go for the first time and uh, actually dig up some more of these fossil thorns. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. There's the present day plant on the left-hand side. There's the fossil one on the right-hand side. These are some wonderful fossil thorns. That's where they come from. There's the coal, just the same ones that were there, or the same type of coal, uh, the same layer of coal that was over there in Australia. You find these thin bands of coal, and when you split them open, you get wonderful fossil plants and wonderful fossil thorns. Now, these are supposed to be the Pennsylvanian and Mississippian. Oh uh, yeah, that's the name that the Americans gave it. You see, we named the rocks first and we called it Carboniferous because they're full of coal, full of carbon. And of course you couldn't go along with our British naming, so you named them after your own places, Mississippian and Pennsylvanian. Nothing to do with millions of years in evolution, everything to do where they were first studied in America, that is, um, Mississippi and Pennsylvania. Yeah, wonderful fossil forms, supposedly 300 million years old. OK, question. When did this rock containing these fossil thorns actually form, according to the Bible? Well, this might help you. Genesis chapter three. Then God said to Adam, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it, the ground is cursed for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you and you shall eat of the herb of the fields the bible is emphatic thorns 
and thistles came after Adam sinned. Therefore, they came after mankind was on the planet. Therefore, they were not part of the original creation at all. And yes, you can get hung up over the botanical terms, but the biblical point is the same. If it's sharp and spiky and sticks off the side of a plant, it's a fossil thorn. And there's no doubt about it, the things that we're finding in the fossil record are fossil thorns, according to the Bible. This rock formed after Adam sinned, not 300 million years ago in the slightest. The Carboniferous Nova Scotia in Canada, uh, therefore, is less than 6,000 years old for sure, um, according to the Bible. Interesting way you get the dilemma, because now all of a sudden I've just made myself very unpopular with all my fellow professors and students at university. They don't like it when I start saying stuff like this. It puts me at odds with modern geology. All right, let's take you to the UK on a UK field trip. Yes, we love it. It was just post-COVID. We were allowed to meet up again. We took people out on a wonderful fossil field trip. We had a great time and we started digging up some wonderful fossils. There I am pointing out a rather particularly interesting specimen. We were at a place called Castleton. Um, wonderful place uh, and it's got some some great fossils there it's got some great uh, mines as well that you can go down we're in the peak district blue john is probably one of the most famous minerals that comes out of there and i was telling people how to go digging for fossils and then i in order to show them thought i better split one open just to show them how they need to do it and i opened up to this fossil Oh, can you see what it is yet? Yeah. I mean, when you first split these open, they're really, really faint. But as they begin to react to the oxygen, the fossil becomes clearer and clearer. You see where I'm pointing the arrows at? Let's get in a little bit closer. Can you see it now starting to show up a little bit clearer? You see it now it's getting even clearer? I mean, put it under a special filter and it's abundantly obvious we are dealing with more fossil thorns. And yes, this is the Carboniferous, the same stuff as the Pennsylvanian and the Mississippi and over in the States. It's the same layer. It's the same bed. It goes all over the world and it's full of these wonderful fossil thorns. 304 million years old, which is how old these are supposed to be. No, not 304 million years old in the slightest, but less than 6,000 years old for sure. I can take you to Northumberland in the UK, another fabulous polystrate fossil tree that you can see next to me there. We go digging through the rocks and again, 318 million years old these fossils are supposed to be and yet we're finding fossil thorns inside of them. Wonderful Neopterous thorns, the same type of thorns that we're finding in Newcastle, the same type of thorns we're finding in Nova Scotia and Canada, the same type of thorns we're finding in Castleton in the United Kingdom. Um, take them out, clean them up, absolutely beautiful. Is this 318 million years old? No, according to the Bible, this is not 318 million years old in the slightest. This is less than 10,000 years old. Um, yes, because you have to realize if you take your Bible at face value, you get an age of the earth of somewhere between six to seven thousand years old. And if you want to argue there are gaps and try and stretch out for as far as you possibly can, 10,000 is the oldest you can get before you're literally just throwing the Bible out of the door and using man's interpretations and putting it into scripture. Yeah, no doubt about it. According to the Bible, these rocks are less than 10,000 years old because they contain those fossil thorns that could only come onto the planet after Adam sinned because the world had gone from good to bad and it's been going downhill ever since. It's beginning worse and worse and worse. In fact, we haven't even got time tonight to go through all our fossil thorn finds. Here's just a brief little montage of them from all over the world, from Nova Scotia in Canada <coughs> excuse me to um tennessee in the usa to folkestone in the uk uh to pennsylvania uh to the devonian stuff in quebec in canada all over the world we're finding these wonderful fossil thorns of course the question really comes down to who is your authority who has the right to decide and who is the one who actually judges the world? Is your authority God's unchanging word or is it man's continually evolving theories? You see, all of these fossils 
were provably formed after Adam sinned because they all contain fossil thorns. And look at where we found them. We found them all the way as far down uh, the supposed geological column, all the way down to the Ordovician, a supposed 450 million years old, a supposed 449 million years before man was on the planet. Ah, interesting. You see, according to the Bible, there was no 450 million years old because the fossil thorns that we find on the Ordovician had to be on the planet after Adam sinned. Hmm. Interesting point. You want the real history of the world? In the beginning, God created and God created everything perfect because it was very good. God made each after its own kind to reproduce and to fill the earth. And it was very good. And God made man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Hey, that's a controversial word to say today, um, but I'm afraid it's straight out of scripture. In the biblical point, God made the world very good in the beginning. Um, it was very good. No thorns, no thistles, no death, no disease, no struggle, no fighting. And yet today we live in a world that has gone from good to bad to worse. Genesis chapter three, man sinned. And now I'm going to say something really controversial. Not me, not John, not anybody watching this stream right now is made in the perfect image of God today. Yes, I know that sounds, oh, of course we're made in the image of God. Well, actually, no, you're not. No, I'm not. No, John's not. I mean, you want the biblical picture? Turn to Genesis chapter five. And Adam has sinned and he is living in a fallen world. And Adam and Eve begat a son and called him Seth. And Seth was made in the image of Adam after Adam's own likeness. It's blatantly says it there. Seth was made in the image of Adam, not the image of God. Now, Adam was made in the image of God. So Seth had that inheritance and only Seth had that inheritance. The animals didn't. The chimpanzees didn't. But Seth was made in the image of his father, the image of Adam. Was Adam a perfect human being at that point? No, he was a fallen human being. He had messed up big time. He'd eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The world was cursed. Sin had entered the world. Death had entered the world. And Seth had inherited that fallen image of his father. And ever since then, every child has taken on the fallen image of their father. I'm not made in the perfect image of God. I'm made in the corrupt image of my father. And he was made in the corrupt image of his father. And he and his, and he and his, all the way back to Adam, the first man, the first man who sinned. And yes, he was made in the perfect image of God originally. Now it is a corrupt image. And ever since that corruption occurred, we've been on the downhill spiral ever since. Man sinned, the fall of, uh, the fall of mankind happened. Man sinned, the world was cursed, and we've been going downhill ever since. And God cursed the ground and thorns and thistles came onto the planet. Yeah, these fossil thorns give us an extremely poignant reminder of that curse. Um, they're horrible things, really. Thorns and death entered the world and we are digging up. I mean, creature, the fossil record, it's full of death because the one thing you know about fossils, you can argue about their age all you like. But the one thing I've never heard anybody argue over is whether or not they're dead. They're definitely dead. It's a record of death. And yet death itself only came onto the planet after Adam sinned. The world had changed from good to bad, and it's been going downhill ever since. Oh, you want the biblical picture? There it is. It's Jesus. Uh, what's he wearing on his head? The crown of thorns. Ah, I wonder if you've ever made that connection before. Why did thorns come onto the planet? Because man sinned. It was part of the curse. It was part of the thing which meant that man now had to die. It was the result of sin. Man had messed up. So don't you blame God when he gave us the world. As John said earlier, uh, it was perfect. We messed up. It's our fault. That's why we need ah, a saviour. And what did our saviour wear as he hung on the cross and took the punishment for our sins? He wore a crown of the very thing that our sin had actually brought onto the planet, a crown of thorns. 
he was taking the ultimate punishment and the representation the the you know that he was wearing there is absolutely amazing you see how it all ties together from perfect creation to fallen thorns to the thorns actually piercing the brow of the man who is dying to take the sins of the world a man who is 100 god and a man who is 100 human and the only that combination could actually would be a redeemer i mean what a wonderful wonderful blessing and a wonderful wonderful uh, uh thing sacrifice that jesus has actually done for us well i hope you start to see the connection and i hope that takes us nicely into the next section because i'm about to hand over to john to go to part number three and yes uh, we'll be doing uh, since i'm back on again now looking at the time it's probably time for everyone to stand up take a deep breath and start asking questions and i need someone to id themselves because i think i recognize a pair of glasses in galaxy 59 is that you sandy no nah. hello whoever you are there i can't hear anything you say Okay, has anyone got any questions on uh, on anything we've said right up from the start to now? Your chance. I've got my sound on, but I can't hear any sound from your end. Joseph? I can, I can yeah, our, our sound is on, but um, most people are, unmute, uh, are on mute, so you'll need to unmute if you want to come and say hello or ask a question. And uh, I'm going to go check over on our YouTube channel as well, uh, because this is going out live on our YouTube channel. And we've had quite a bit of interaction there, so we're going to see if we've uh, if we've got any questions on there as well. John, I got a quick question for you. How many fossilized trees have you guys found that are not native to Australia? How many fossilized trees have we found that are not native to Australia? Um, let's reverse it that way. How many trees do we find living in Australia today that are found in the fossil record? Mm -hmm. That's one way to ask the question. The other question is, do we find any trees in the fossil record that are not actually living in Australia today? Mm -hmm. um, the answer to those questions are a little difficult because most of the fossil trees that you find are well represented because they tend to be largely in the pine family, mm -hmm. right? So you'll find like in England, you'll find fossil pine trees that today only live in South America but you can put them back and let them grow in England and they will grow. So it would seem to be the recent climate which has killed them off. And the same is true in Australia. You'll find trees in the fossil record that you can actually bring back and grow in Australia and New Zealand. A classic example is the gum tree. There are no living gum trees in New Zealand until Governor Gray took them back, but there are plenty of fossil gum trees in the, in the rocks of New Zealand. So, um, I've never tried to add up the numbers, um, but it's probably easier to say, like my professor did, if you add up all the fossil plants, then probably well over 90% of them represent extinct species, right? Not extinct kinds of trees, but extinct species. That's probably the easier way to do it. And what he didn't realise he was saying as an evolutionist is all the evidence tells you we're running out of plants, Right. In Australia, we know the major cause has been the drying out of the climate so that some of our trees today that reach maybe two or three feet or a couple of metres tall in the rocks, they're up to 60 or 70 metres tall. Um, that they, they are diminishing because of the climate, not because they're, they're um, evolving in any way, shape or form. That's probably the best way, unless you want to answer is there any other questions you could ask, Joe, uh, to that one. Uh, not, not really. Anything that I'd add is is the, that point which you touched on earlier is uh, it, what's remarkable is how many native Australian trees or trees that are native to Australia today you find in our UK fossil record. I mean, there's this enormous amount. You come down to the Jurassic Coast along the south coast and it's, you know, uh, southern conifer after southern conifer which are native to Australia, certainly native to the southern hemisphere. Uh, and the only kind of southern conifer that does moderately well in the UK, but not brilliantly, are the sort of uh, high mountain and how um, high mountainous South American ones. Um, the and even they're trees. not the monkey puzzle trees. Yeah. And they're not even uh, that great um, compared, <laughs> compared to the kind of stuff we get in the fossil record and compared to the stuff that you get over in Australia. And so, of course, you then have a nice little climate connection there 
because, well, your Australian ones just don't really grow very well here in the UK. So the fact that they're buried here means that at some point in the past, the climate was a lot, lot warmer. And so if you get all caught up with the climate change stuff of today and it, you realise that according to history, climate has gone up and down and up and down uh, as long as we can see back, certainly according to the geological record as well as the historical record. So, uh, And you, by the way, you find all of these trees over in America as well in the states the other big trees you find over there are the big lycopods um as well which you also find you saw the big polystrate tree that we had here in the uk in northumberland almost identical to the trees that you can find around spencer in tennessee um and i've been there i've seen them john's taken me there they're almost they're almost identical the big lycopods so yeah a large amount of fossil trees and some real real great evidence and I believe you're actually growing a very unique Australian pine tree in your backyard these days. We're, we're doing our best, yes, because it is. this is England and it is wet and it is cold. Um, <laughs> we've got the greenhouses and everything else going. Yes, we've got a wonderful tree uh, called the Woolamai pine, which is also known as the dinosaur tree because we found, well, you find fossils of them in Australia, don't you, John? Uh, and we they do. thought that it... They thought it was extinct for, you know, been extinct for the last 65 million years. And then one turned up in Woolamai National Park Forest. So, um, yeah, we've managed to get yeah, hold of some of those. That right, Joe. It's now Woolamai National Park because they found the tree, not the other way around. Oh, right, not the other way around. Right. Owned by a certain person who we know. <laughs> I see. But, yeah, extinct trees found again. Uh, I have a question. For either or both of you guys? Yep. First, I want to say thank you guys for having this. It's really awesome to hear from you guys. Just wonderful. Very, uh, very cool stuff to see. Really, really appreciate it. Those fossils, everything. It's awesome. Um, I wanted to ask specifically in reference to the pictures that John was showing of the fossilized trees. You had shown that there was a series of them in a horizontal pattern. And then there was uh, about two in your photographs. I'm sure there were more that were in a vertical pattern position can you guys provide an explanation or what your theory is as to why these fossils are in all of these different variants of position what okay. was that, the reasoning behind it the answer is actually fairly easy you can demonstrate it with a glass of water and a box of matchsticks right if you still have old-fashioned matchsticks you know the ones with the little red phosphorus ends on go through the box cut all the ends off because the phosphorus on the end will sort of mess up the experiment. Uh, what you've got is a portion of a pine tree, right? They use pine because it burns so well. So make sure you've only got the pine tree. And then what you do is you fill the glass full of water and you put the matches on the top of the water. Now, initially what they'll do is they'll float like this. And then if you keep watching, they'll start to begin to sink, but they'll sink like this. Unknown to most people, they, they don't actually sink straight down. They'll actually soak from one end first and then they'll sink like this. Now, I first became aware of this reading a report from the Admiralty uh, where a poor ship's captain, you may remember uh, in, in the days of yore, the ship's captain was totally responsible to the Lords of the Admiralty for the property of the ship that he was using. And it reports you know, your, your, your lordships, I ran into a tree in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and it went straight through the, the hull. OK, now we've known for ages that many floating trees float vertically, even though we've only discovered why in the last little while. So trees float vertically, matchsticks sink vertically. And I have done hundreds and hundreds of experiments now and film some, and you can see them on creationresearch.net. You can go to jurassicarc.com and watch some of the experiments. Um, you can read about it in our fact file. It, it, the simplest experiment is for you to get a lovely white rose, right? Yeah, we've just had Mother's Day in Australia. I'm sure they did a lot of white rose business at the florist. You get your white rose, you stand it in your vase of water, but you actually put red food colouring in the water. And what you find is that over the next couple of days, the red food colouring soaks up through the rose stem into the white rose and you end up with red, red veins and then the whole lot will go pink. Why? Because even though you've cut the, the rose off, it's now no longer connected. 
what you've got is a rose which behaves according to the properties that are built into that stem. Alive or dead, the stem will conduct water in one direction only. So you find that a tree, same as a stem, is cut off, uh, it's ripped up. The water still goes from the root end upwards. It's floating, it comes fresh in, the bottom end gets heavier first, then it begins to sink, then it will sit like this for a while, sometimes a month, sometimes a year, and then it will slowly sink vertically. Then when it hits the bottom, it will actually begin to tip over until finally it will lay down flat. So that's why you end up with a whole mixture of flat logs, inclined logs, vertical logs, and logs that haven't sunk at all. Um, so you find that it's the properties of the tree that does this and in association with the water and which end gets waterlogged first. So that's your reasoning. And it's got nothing to do with a tree being bent over in a storm or anything like this. Uh, one of the most famous inclined trees is currently lying on the ground in the Edinburgh um, Natural History Museum. It was dug up out of a quarry uh, not far from where my dad grew up in Scotland. And it was at 45 degrees. There's a, a, a drawing of a man sitting there on top of it. Now they've excavated, it's lying down flat, doesn't look anywhere near as spectacular. If we didn't have the nice little etching of it, we wouldn't know. But we've seen plenty ourselves turned over at an angle and they're stuck there. Not because they were growing inclined, there's no roots, no branches, they have just got to that point and they're buried whole as the sediment comes in on top. Joe, anything to add? That's just the key thing. It's the fact that these fossils clearly did not grow in that position um, because they've most of them have no roots. Uh, and even if they have a bit of a sort of a, a root bulb, the sort of the bulge at the bottom, uh, they're certainly not sitting in any soil. There's no evidence from the surrounding matrix of rock that they're sitting in that there was ever any soil or, like I said earlier, the pine leaves or anything like that. They've been stripped of their branches. It's literally just a water eroded log which you can only get by crushing around and washing around in water for a while, right? And then you end up with a, a log just like that. So something that definitely been swept in by water. Now we need to have a mechanism by which we tilt them and get them upright, right? And you'll find that every single log does that. Uh, it will absorb water from one way to another. So you'll find that enough of them were able to actually absorb enough water to get waterlogged at the bottom, which is enough to tilt them up at either an angle or completely vertically, and then actually bury them in um, the sediment that was being swept along at the same time of the flood. Now, if you want to go one step further, right, because geologists have arguments and debates all the time about where flood boundaries are and stuff, right, and when does the Permian finish and the Triassic come in, when does the Carboniferous finish and the Permian come in, right? Uh, but you can certainly see connections between all of these deposits, but uh, one of the our famous um, geology professors, Professor Derek Ager, right, who uh, actually really did most of the original work on polystrate trays and um, was the professor of Swansea University in Wales. He made the important point that if you add up all the Carboniferous, right, it's over in the USA. We call it Pennsylvania and Mississippian. It's here in the UK. It's all over down throughout Europe. It turns up in Australia. It covers an enormous part of the world, right? This is a world wide deposit no doubt about it it's also a worldwide flood deposit because of the evidence of the trees the fossils the way that it forms it wasn't a ginormous swamp it wasn't a slow gradual deposition it was a massive rapid flood burial dump and it goes all over the world so you've got the evidence of worldwide flood right there if you know what you're looking for that's why the bible says not only do the living trees clap their hands, even the dead trees cry out judgment. Uh, and that's why it also uses the tree as a symbol of judgment upon sin. And it talks about it being a shame for a man to be hung upon a tree. Uh, so you tie the whole lot together. And it's not only the, the living trees, the dead trees, the whole lot. And it said, if you want to do an experiment, get your matches, drop the phosphate off the top, put them in a glass and watch them sink vertically. Or if you, if you haven't got time to do that, walk along the beach and watch the seaweed. Because even grass does this. The seaweed will do this. And then it will sink to the bottom. 
right? So anything that soaks water in from the, at the bottom. And hello, young people over there. I recognize Galaxy 59 now. Lovely to see you watching with us. So, yeah. Um, any, any other questions? Uh, Sister Lorena? Oh, oh, sorry. Well, you're on the go ahead, Sister. I have a question. Sam has a question. Can you hear him? Does, uh, hello, you're freezing. Okay. Okay, so uh, you know how di dinosaurs have like tough bones to help them sur survive uh, almost any attack or prime? And when they die, and in school, I heard that they're tough bones uh keeps the bones from rotting and that's how they become a fossil but that still doesn't explain how dragonflies became a fossil so okay so the question is and joe you can comment in a moment it's the fact that they had such tough bones such big bones such solid bones that enable them to be a fossil but that doesn't explain how soft things like dragonflies became a fossil did i understand that correctly Yes. Okay, Joe, you'll go first. All right. Well, you're absolutely right because there's an enormous amount of um, soft, squidgy stuff that ends up getting preserved. Um, you have mentioned dragonflies, right? But you can also have a look at uh, things like um, uh, jellyfish in the fossil record. We had some visitors to our museum uh, this afternoon, and I was taking them around and showing them some stuff. And we have some wonderful fossil jellyfish displays. Um, I mean, fossil jellyfish, you see them washed up on the beach and they just go horrible and rotten, you know, just before the next tide comes in. So if you want to fossilize things, you need to bury it very quickly. Now, it is true that there are some things which are sort of already fossils before they've actually even been buried. Teeth are one example of that. Uh, things like stromatolites, which is an algae that produces its own rock. These are all things that are kind of rocks already. So, yes, they're hard, they're tough. They're more likely to actually be preserved. But even when you're coming to the things like dinosaur bones, and yes, dinosaur bones are big, dinosaur bones are tough, but that doesn't really explain how they would survive all of the natural environments and all of the scavengers and all of the eating and all of the decomposing if they weren't buried very quickly. In fact, you can go one step further and say, well, all right, how are these dinosaurs actually found? And what you'll find is that the majority of them actually show evidence of being drowned. I mean, their heads are bent backwards, their tails are up in the air, their legs are squashed underneath. There's no doubt about it. They all drowned. Now, drowning and then burial within three minutes. That's where the evidence actually says, because if you want to preserve them in that funny looking position, you have to bury them in three minutes. Well, if you're burying and fossilizing these creatures in three minutes, the toughness of their bones has got nothing to do with the preservation, really. All right, one final point for me before John can comment. One of the bits of research that I'm involved in is actually going into big, tough dinosaur bones and scooping out the soft, squidgy stuff that's still left inside of them. All right, And no matter how big and no matter how tough your dinosaur bones are, if they really are 65 million years old, they shouldn't have a single trace of soft, gooey stuff like red blood cells and proteins and everything else inside of them. And yet that's exactly what we're finding. And uh, spoiler alert, we're really trying very hard and it looks like we're going to be able to do it to try and get some dinosaur DNA out of it as well. So uh, keep praying and keep supporting because this research is really vital. So if you want to support the research, Joe, creationresearch.net, there are easy ways to do it. To add to what Joe said, if you want to know my favorite animal to take on a dinosaur dig, it's a dog. Or yeah. I'm looking for dingo tracks, or I'm looking for cattle, and I'm looking for bones with chew marks on. And I, I'm serious. That's exactly what I'm doing. Here's an experience we had at Jurassic Ark. We, would, we had a big burial pit. And we did this deliberately to show kids how to excavate bones. The reason for that is I, John Mackay, he who knows everything, supposedly he really doesn't, when he dug up his first dinosaur bone, did I ever blow it, right? I was so excited at digging up this dinosaur bone, I dug gently all around it. Then I lifted it up and it just fell to pieces. It looked so tough and solid until I picked it up and then it wasn't so solid at all. 
and I needed to learn that you excavated the top and then you coated it with, you know, that stuff you put on broken arms uh, and you plaster it all over and you keep that all together. Then you gently excavate underneath it and then it's already holding together. Now, in case you're wondering why some of them are soft like that, here's the illustration. Take one hard fossil bone, leave it at Jurassic Arc, hide it in the tree so I can easily find it to show the kids. Why do they need to see a fossil bone? Because we had learned that if you bury bones in our bone pit and you leave them for a couple of months, they already start to fossilize. Fossilization just means they start to soak up metals, iron out of the ground. And so the bone would go from, you know, white bone that had been bleached in the sun, then it would go light brown, then dark brown, then almost black. And it only took a few months. And you could weigh it. You could measure the amount of iron that had soaked into it. Anyway, that meant the bone was still relatively fresh by comparison. These had come from hunters. They'd come from farmers. They'd come from dead animals lying out in the paddock. The funny thing was, one day I went to find my bone and the dog who'd noticed me going to this tree, he actually beat me to it. He took my fossil bone and he ate it. Mm -hmm. Ate it because it still had nutrition inside it. So, Joe, all the best. You will find dinosaur tissues. You will find material inside it. In fact, I hope you find a bit of skin and you extract some of the meat from it. that will be a real, real class stuff for our museum as well as everything else. So creationresearch.net, go look. Look up the experimental section too if you enjoyed that bit on the fossil trees. It's all there listed under research and then experiments. So one more question for the day. Uh, hello, hi, Mr. McKay and uh, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, did the did the nose flood wipe out the dinosaurs? Oh, and uh, Mr. McKay, you do remind me a bit of John Hammond from Jurassic Park. Well, that's really nice for him. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, did the dinosaurs wipe out Noah's Ark? Remember why God sent the flood? He sent the flood because all male, all humans, and all animal flesh, all flesh had become violent. We fail to realize that when you have a puppy dog and a pussycat together, and the puppy dog goes, Grr, and the pussycat goes, Grr, and they go, yeah! the real reason for that is our sin. It's hard to come to grips with the fact that they hate one another sometimes because we, in the beginning, turned our back on God and sin has affected everything. So by the time of Noah's day, it's only 16, 1700 years after Adam's sin that it had begun to affect all the animals, not to the point where they were attacking people yet. That would come afterwards. But it does say all flesh, not just people, all flesh had become violent. So God organized Noah to build the ark and he sent two of every air-breathing, air land-dwelling creatures on the ark and seven of some. Okay, now his purpose was to preserve all flesh that lived on the land that breathed the breath of air. Dinosaurs, we dig them up. They had lungs. Dinosaurs, we've got their stomachs. We've got their poop. We know what they ate, right? Uh, and many of them simply are recorded as eating vegetables. So therefore, they got on the ark, and the Bible says the purpose of the ark was to preserve the creatures through, right through God's judgment of the flood and let them off the other side. So since Noah's flood, we often get asked questions like, did the flood wipe out the dinosaurs? We never get asked, did the flood wipe out the Australian Tasmanian tiger? Did it wipe out the, the, the creatures that, that um, are not here today? that we know have died off in the past 200 years. With the creatures that we know have become extinct, you're looking at the reason. We are. Nine times out of 10, we kill them. We shot them. We, we move them out of existence. Sometimes we have no idea why they died out. Genetic weakness, too much inbreeding, living in an isolated place, running out of food. There are other reasons apart from humanity has caused extinction. So it is unlikely that any creature that got on the ark actually didn't get off again, right? So therefore, two of the dinosaur kind of each kind would have got off, and it's therefore other creatures that would have killed them off or the environment. 
I'll give you my best suggestion. Then, Joe, you might want to add some. Dinosaurs being reptiles. Australia is full of reptiles. It has some that are similar to the dinosaurs, e.g. the crocodilosauruses. Did you catch how I said that? Crocodilosauruses, because they were the first sauruses. Their name officially is Archosaurs, the first sauruses. Uh, saurus it refers to the shape they make. You know, they have an S shape, right? They crawl along in an S shape. So therefore, the Archosaurs are the first sauruses. They walk like this with their body shape. So Archosaurs, um, you will find that here in Australia, we notice an interesting habit. Um, they no longer live where I live. I live in the subtropics. It's too cold to keep crocodiles down here. What happens? We do get a few days that are cold in winter, sometimes a few cold weeks. But unlike us, the crocodile's stomach turns off once the temperature gets below a certain degrees. So therefore, if you keep a crocodile here in a zoo, don't feed it in winter. The food will rot in its stomach. Unless it lives up in the north where it's constantly warm, it will die of rotted food in its, its stomach. So when you look at the crocodiles, there's one reason why they can become extinct that you may not even think of, and that is the climate. Secondly, if it gets too cold, then here's something else interesting that doesn't happen to you. The sex of their egg changes. So when it's cold, they have boys. When it's hot, they have girls. When it's warm, they have boys and girls. Okay, um, you ladies, aren't you glad the temperature of the day doesn't depend whether you have a boy or a girl? But if you're a crocodile, if you are living in a climate where it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter or colder and colder and colder, the sex ratio will change. End result, doesn't matter which way it goes, you will become extinct. So in reality, there are many things that would have altered after Noah's flood, climate being a big one. Cold and snow are first mentioned in the book of Job, as is the last reference to big monsters in the Old Testament by and large. So you find that after the days of Job, it would seem the dinosaurs are on a one-way exit ticket from planet Earth, despite the fact that we can be mean and nasty and killers. Joe, anything to add? Yeah, just if you want a fun afternoon, do a few Google searches on ideas as to why the dinosaurs died out. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, the standard story that you hear on the mainstream media is that uh, an asteroid wiped them out, yet there just simply isn't the evidence for that. Um, in fact, there was a whole program that went out on the BBC recently, which you probably got to see in America with our famed David Attenborough, all about the dinosaurs and the last day of the extinction of the dinosaurs. And really, there wasn't a jot of evidence that that was the thing which caused the dinosaurs to go extinct. Instead, what they found was some wonderful evidence of the dinosaurs being buried very rapidly in a flood, right? Uh, but if you want to go Google and have a little look around for why, ideas as to why the dinosaurs died out, uh, there's some great thinking out there. Um, it is hilarious, some of them. Um, one of my favorite ones is that the idea that marijuana actually evolved the same time with the dinosaurs and they couldn't cope with getting high all the time and that's what killed them off and these are these are genuine theories right up there with uh, the, the flowers evolving uh, and dinosaurs being allergic to the pollen so they died of chronic hay fever so these are all genuine ideas as to why the dinosaurs died out because the reality is we simply don't know it's the one of the biggest mysteries in secular science however if you were to have a massive climate change event that also didn't wipe out all life on earth because that's one of the biggest problems with an asteroid extinction is why did it wipe out the dinosaurs but none of the nothing else none of the other mammals well one of the key things is that mammals can actually survive quite well with changes in climate um we, they've done very well out of that dinosaurs noah's flood uh, John's already pointed out two of the biggest reasons as to why the dinosaurs probably went extinct. Uh, cold and heat changes in temperature, gender and sex of the eggs is, a, is, a, is another key one because we know that lots of reptiles, even if it's not quite as uh, strong as it is in crocodilians, where it is literally if you incubate them at a higher temperature, it's girls. If you incubate them at a lower temperature, it's boys. But we do know that uh, the gender is usually connected in some way to the temperature 
that the egg is actually incubated at. So uh, in the case of lizards and stuff like that. Um, so there's some of the, the, the main key things, but you've also got to remember what's the number one reason as to why creatures go extinct today? We kill them off. We kill the big ones. Right, that's why the size of African elephants has been going down. And you hear the stories of when the first explorers went into Africa and the enormous bull elephants that they see. And you see some of the tusks are just ridiculous sized, right? You don't, simply don't find them like that anymore because we've killed off the big ones. So only the small ones can actually carry on reproducing. And as a result, you create a genetic bottleneck where the creatures are forcing themselves to extinction anyway. And you're just helping <laughs> helping speed up the process right um i mean let's face it you've come off of the ark uh you're you know you people have come off the ark you're at the tower of babel god confuses your languages he sends you into all the world and you happen to move next door to a dinosaur how long are you going to let it live there and risk your family's lives right you're not you're going to go and hunt it you're going to use your god-given ingenuity to outwit that dinosaur and actually make sure that your family is safe so there's a whole i, I don't i don't think it's going to be a one uh you know one reason answer as to why the dinosaurs died out it's because you you simply can't get to a one reason answer it will definitely have a lot to do with the flood i'm sure it will definitely have a lot to do with climate but there are several other factors as well um that basically push to the extinction of the dinosaur the biggest one being it certainly seems that a pre-flood world suited dinosaurs a lot better than a post-flood world does all right let me make one last comment if you want to follow up creation research go to creationresearch.net get on our mailing list because we do lots of other things apart from this uh, we have a regular zoom broadcast every friday night english time nine o'clock p.m i have no idea what time that is in in uh, the usa we uh, uh, it's, it's now 3 a.m. in England, so I'm beginning to feel sorry for Joseph. So I should, suspect we should pull the plug and let him go to bed. And I'm, uh, uh, we've been up a long time too, haven't we, Joseph, doing several programs today. It has been great to be with you. If you have any other pro, uh, questions, you can go to our Q&A site or you can have a look at some of our great books. And Sandy and Chuck and everybody there who I do recognize, great to see you. Jevin, thanks for the invite. We really do appreciate it. And we do look forward to seeing you again, perhaps even live. Hey, Joe. Hey, yeah, no, it'd be wonderful. Amen. Amen. All right. Any final words, Jevin? Yeah, I would like to tell everybody how they can bless your ministry. Yeah. Please forgive me. It's not beautiful. If you guys could just take a picture of this. Um, this is how John would like us to bless his ministry. And also, please write, write down that it's a donation or a gift. Otherwise, um, they'll have to pay on their end to receive this blessing. That's all I have. Well, maybe one more thing. In my heart, I just, I love it when I meet and encounter believers who have been working hard for the Lord. So I just want to thank you guys for your hard work. John, you've been doing this for decades. And I think it's even a bigger reason for us to bless those who've been working hard for our Lord and Savior, right? Their work is absolutely important. So I thank you guys. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, that's all that I have on my end. I guess I'll let you go unless you got anything else to say, Brother John. Oh, good night and God bless or good morning and God bless or whatever it is where you are. Okay. <laughs> Great to see Bye. you all guys. And uh, yeah, Lord willing, I'll be over in the States at some point. So it'll be good to meet you in person.